Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. Talktainmentradio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or k e World Network, LLC. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now... Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. Alrighty, welcome to the best hour in radio from coast to coast and heard all the way around the world. This is TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio, and you are in touch with the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller. I'm the co-host, Mr. Bobby, and this is Radio the Way It Should Be Heard. We are here and we are ready to go. And as usual, we will start off by saying, how are you, Mr. Fuller? I'm still learning. And so am I. As a matter of fact, I went over, I went over that concept within myself this week as I was uh, dealing with um, some issues with uh, people and so forth and what's been going on with the news, and I realize that, yes, I am every day is an experience, an opportunity for me to learn, and hopefully the callers are the same. Okay, uh, let's go to the phone lines, and uh, line number one, you are on with Mr. Neely Fuller on the compensatory concept. What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Go ahead, caller. You are on line with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. My name is Joseph Turner. I'm sure she won't remember me, so many people called in. But I had I emailed him an article, a document called Stealing a Nation, and I just wanted to know if you received it okay, and okay. I would like to have okay. an opinion about it. I'll let Mr. Fuller answer that. Mr. Fuller, do you remember receiving such a communication? A communication about... What was that, ma'am? Yeah, it's, it's a documentary that I saw on YouTube. It's called Stealing a Nation. Stealing a Nation. Mm-hmm. And I called Mr. Fuller about it, and... You know, ask him if he knew about it and if he could comment about it online. Okay. You know, doing one of his talk shows. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fuller? Yes, I haven't seen uh, the documentary that she's talking about, so I can't oh. comment on it because I haven't seen it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, okay. You, for, thank you for your call. Uh, Mr. Fuller, um, what is some of the things that, as we were on last week to this week, that you have discovered that you would – like to make comment about or feel that we need our conscience raised about that? Well, I think we need to pay attention to the educational system. Uh, I understand that there is a trial that's just been completed in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's been in the news lately. And uh, some people have talked to me about it just tentatively. Now, I don't know enough, inf- I don't have enough information myself mm-hmm. to. Uh, make an overall concise uh, detail comment on it, uh, what my reaction is to it. But generally speaking, the educational system is in a mess where black people are concerned worldwide. And going back to the 1950s in this area of the world, when You had the Supreme Court decisions about schooling and all like that. Then you had the Little Rock crisis uh, in the mid-1950s where they were talking about the segregation schools, where they're going to have segregation and integration. And uh, there were actually soldiers called out to quell that situation and try to stabilize it and whatnot. And it's been kind of up in arms ever since. Mm -hmm. Now you have black teachers... Uh, who have gone through school and tried to get some education and whatnot so that they can teach other uh, black students because that's mostly who they're assigned to teach. Mm -hmm. And it's been a continual mess all along this line. It was a mess before then, before even the controversy about segregated schools and all like that and the Jim Crow era. Uh, 
the education of black people has always been something that the white supremacist system has paid attention to because they have always seen to it that you don't want an educated black person, meaning what do you mean by education? A black person who knows how to solve problems. You don't want any of that nowhere on the planet. You want them to always be dependent when it comes to information. This right. is the white supremacist creed. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they don't make it. It doesn't make any difference how they go about doing it. Whether it's putting black teachers in chains and have them in orange jumpsuits and have them following their school dropouts right into the prison system. I mean, where you just have an ongoing system, which is what the white supremacists do. They say, hey, we're going to have white supremacy. I don't care how you shake it up and pour it. And in the educational system, you don't want It's dangerous. A slave that knows how to get things done. A slave that knows as much as the master. You don't ever want that to happen. In a system of white supremacy, you just can't have that. It's bad for business. So then... So keep um, them ignorant. Keep them in turmoil. Keep have, have a breakdown in the school system where the black teachers get to the place where they don't really even care about the students. Or if they do care, the students will see to it that there's no point in mm-hmm. caring because I'm not going to try to learn anything anyway because if I learn something, I'm not going to be able to get a job because I'm, it's not dealing with you here in the class. I have to deal with the great big white world outside of these walls. I don't see any white students in here with me, and that's sending me a signal right now that something is going on, because even in your larger school systems like Chicago, from the information that's come to me since the 1950s, and you're talking about a half century ago, all of the so-called schools are still, still quote, unquote, segregated. Mm-hmm. Yes. That when you look around a classroom, you don't see an interspersion inter- of black and white together. Mm-hmm. And that is by going design. Going into the world, solving the world's problems. Mm-hmm. No, it's the white people over on the other side of town doing their thing, and the black people over here on this side of town falling apart. Yeah. Because that's the thing that they do. That's right. Because everything is in total <laughs> chaos, which is what the white supremacists want. Mm-hmm. They want chaos in any school or any place that's supposed to be a school where you have black people trying to learn something that is of constructive value. Mm-hmm. So it's just a continuation. Right. Okay. With that being said, uh, let's go to the phone lines. Go ahead, caller. You're on with uh, Mr. Nearly Fuller, Jr. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, in, in the same vein of the uh, conversation here, I, I would recommend a book, uh, especially Mr. Fuller's book, hands down. But another book entitled The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 through 1935, by Dr. James D. Anderson. And, and he really deals with the, the, the origin of the, uh, of the black schools and how, how former slaves were, were, very, were very important in even pushing for public schools. And I think just understanding the history of, of how the black school even came about, or public schools in general, would really would really go a long way to uh, helping us understand, you know, what we're currently seeing in okay. the education system. But I wanted to ask Mr. Fuller another question, kind of in, in a different vein, but still dealing especially with the uh, compensatory concept. Mr. Fuller, you said that, you know, if, if people really started taking your work serious, then we would really see, you know, the, the racists, the white supremacists uh, really come down hard on you and I guess anyone else who, who supports uh, said concept. So uh, assuming, because I, I, I suppose you thought this out, that eventually one day people will finally get it and it will become, I mean, we, we will really start thinking along the lines of replacing racism uh, with justice. So uh, assuming, if you will, and if you, you could do this, Assuming one was approached by, let's say, a, a law enforcement official saying, hey, you know, this uh, stuff you're talking about, you support the compensatory concept, that's, that's against the law. You know, that's against the law. We, we accuse you of, uh, of being a, a, a terrorist. You know, we, we take that as being um, just as racist and, and, and evil as you, you say. It's reverse racism, and what you are saying supporting the compensatory concept is just plain wrong. Um, what would you say to that? Mr. Fuller? Uh, if I were approached by an investigator, 
yes, about sir. what I have written? Yes. What would I say? Yes, sir. I would just listen to the questions or what the, uh, whatever the accusations are. And uh, they would have to be specific, I guess. If you're talking about legal approaches to anything, uh, all I'm doing is trying to, I always say broadly speaking, the purpose of everything I've written and the purpose for me being on this program is to replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice in order to clear the way for the production of universal man and universal woman in a universe dominated by truth, justice, correctness, and peace in a capsule. That would be my response. And then I would open the floor for questions for anybody who had questions, because I've already cited what I'm trying to do. And I wouldn't care what investigation agency it is. I mean, I welcome that. Investigate. That's what I'm trying to do. Investigate. Investigate everything that will produce that result. Yes, because that's the result I'm looking for. That's the result I'm working for. And whomever the investigators are, I would ask them, Sir, ma'am, why aren't you doing the same thing that I am doing? Because we're dealing with the greatest problem that the world has ever seen. There's never been a problem greater than this one. This thing called a race problem. Everybody has been trying to wrap their brains around it. And I'm just one of the crowd. Hmm. Just a small voice in the crowd. So why aren't you, sir? Why aren't you, ma'am, on board with this? Why are you wasting time trying to investigate a person who is trying to straighten out the biggest problem on the planet? Why aren't you just coming to me and telling me what you have found that you are doing? And we can all join hands. I mean, I'm ready to work with you. Otherwise, I mean, what is this all about? Why are we just looking at each other? I mean, we should be trying to work together to get these things done. And, or, I have a question. What is it you're trying to do? And why are you trying to do it? If you're not trying to rid the world of racism and replace it with a system of justice, what is it you are trying to do, sir? Ma'am, tell me. And I'll get on board with it if there's anything greater than this project that I'm trying to work on. Because that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to do anything else. Thank you both. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your um, for your call. And uh, let's, this is from um, Craig in Detroit. Um, he asks, my logic tells me that white people truly hate and want to annihilate non-white people uh, based off their years of practicing racism, white supremacy. The racism that is practiced today is more refined but they appear committed to mistreating non-whites. Uh, why is that? And can Mr. Fuller share his opinion on it if he thinks white people hate or dislike black people and his opinion and why? No, well, generally speaking, it just, I think, if I understand the question, it comes down to what is the system of white supremacy for? What is the goal now that it's in place? Now, how it got started, I mean, is highly controversial. A lot of people say that it had different reasons, uh, and all of these reasons may be valid, or maybe none of them are valid, or maybe just some of them are valid. I haven't looked that far into it, I mean, how it got started. But I do know that since it's in place, what the benefits are that go with it. So what are these quote-unquote benefits? Fun, glory, and material gain. This is why it's so hard to get rid of, because it's hard to tell a white person who was born into the system, because every, every person, non-white and white, who it, has been born into the system of white supremacy, that includes all of the people who are on the planet now, that's the only system we are working in. There's no other system. So if a white person is born in this system, a white person is told, now, you are white. You're classified as white. Now, you're fortunate enough by being born white. It wasn't your fault that you were born white. You shouldn't be blamed for that, for being born white. You didn't have anything to do with that. So, but you do have a choice. 
you can mm-hmm. you can participate in the system or you can try to dismantle the system that you were born in. Yes. That's the choice that you have. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. if you want to remain in the system or be a part of the system, then you will get benefits from that, which is fun, glory, and material gain. One, two, three. These are the things you get out of it. If you want to dismantle it and have a system of justice, you may lose all three of those benefits. You may lose some, you know, a lot of things that you have gained from this system, including the fun, the glory, and the material benefits. You may have to share with people. You know, um, Mr. Fuller, what you just said, I found it very difficult to accept. However, with the way that I do things, I did the research on what you just spoke to. And I found out, in particular, from uh, the site called uh, WheatMoney.com, and it explained just exactly what you said in detail about the privilege, the advantages, and the position that white uh, people have, or in particular, the the what these white what racism or these supremacists have designed for them, benefiting from the system that they have designed, which is racism, white supremacy. I was just completely uh, just blown away by that. And you got this knowledge and began to spread this. A lot of people do not understand it and do not really see it. It takes a, well, it took me a while to understand what you were saying. Uh, for example, when you spoke about race soldiers, I used to just say police brutality. I don't say, say that anymore because I understand exactly now what happened. They are race soldiers, which they've been hired to do what they do, which is to kill uh, non uh, or non-white people, black people, in other words, or brown people. They've been hired to kill them. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay, anyway, uh, so yeah, you're 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 right on right on with that. Um, he also asked, Mr. Fuller, can you define self-respect? And if he thinks that self-love and self-respect will also help us to replace white supremacy with justice. Yes. Now, I don't use the word respect and or self-respect the way that most people use it. In the word guide that I have uh, that you can get by going to producejustice.com, uh, I define respect as refusing to lie to yourself. That's why I say a person should never ask anyone to give them three things. One is respect, one is love, and uh, the, the other it kind of slips in my mind right now. Uh, one is respect, and one is love, and one is an apology. That's correct. Respect love, and an apology. Now, you never ask anyone for respect, ever, ever. Like a lot of black people say, you don't diss me. You know, no one, you know, you're asking for the incorrect thing. If you're asking for a person to respect you, that's something you give yourself. There's only one type of respect, and that is self-respect, which means what? I give it a compensatory definition. It's not the same as courtesy. Sometimes people think that respect and courtesy are the same thing. They're not. Respect means you refuse to lie to yourself. You don't tell yourself a lie. I mean, you tell yourself something that you know is not true. Yes. You are self-destroying when you're doing that. That thing called self-respect, you are are throwing it away. And nobody can give you that. And nobody can take it away from you because it's something you have to give yourself. Right. It's impossible for anybody to disrespect you. That's totally impossible. And to run around talking about they, they didn't respect me. I went on the job today and they don't show me no respect. <laughs> that has nothing to do with you. That's something you give to yourself. Yes, sir. Just don't lie to yourself. It doesn't make any difference what the other person says. <laughs> if the other person is discourteous, let them be discourteous. That's on them. That's on That them. has nothing to do with you. Yes, sir. You make sure that you are the most courteous person in the room. All righty. You're listening to the Compensatory Concept here exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, radio 
the way it should be heard. And um, we want to discuss the book. Uh, Mr. Fuller, can you discuss your book and the title and where we can get it before we move on? The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism. And, of course, racism is described as white supremacy. There's no other form of racism other than white supremacy. There's no black supremacy or no Hispanic supremacy or or no this, uh, this, that, and the other type of supremacy on this planet. Maybe on other planets, but it doesn't exist on this planet. You have a system of white supremacy. That's the only government on this planet. And when people understand that, then they understand how the entire world is run. It's run on the basis of people who believe in mistreating people based on color. And those people, unfortunately, happen to be at this juncture classified as white. That doesn't mean all white people are racist. Right. But it means that those white people who are racist are the most powerful and the smartest people that have ever appeared on this planet in recorded history. Hmm. And the evidence shows that. Mm-hmm. And it should be replaced with a system of justice. It's not personal, it's business. So that that's what this the, the book is about. Okay, ProduceJustice.com. And, it, and you can go to ProduceJustice.com to get it. Okay, and that's a good lead into this question by Mr. Edward Tate. He said, how is a system of justice created without any unity and or organization if, in fact, it took Organize, organize injustice to conquer the world, would it in fact take organized justice to free the world? Well, it depends on what you mean by organize. The, the, the greatest organization in the world is in a person's head. Each individual person. There's no such thing as the masses. People don't walk around with their heads glued to everybody else's head, uh, except for the what they call, you know, uh, you know, in a, a slang fashion, and this is an incorrect term, uh, I call it co-joined heads. Sometimes people call it Siamese twins. The world is not made up of people who are so-called, in that slang term, Siamese twins. I mean, where everybody's born with everybody's head pasted to somebody else's head or joined, I mean, one to the other. No, people are individuals, and each individual has a brain. The normal individual. And that brain is the seat of an organization. If you organize one person and then organize the other person standing next to that person and organize the other person who is over on the other side of the mountain, around what? What is organization? Tapping into the logic that's in the universe. If each individual person does that, Black people have this thing of, if they look around and they don't see another black person in sight, and this is the way we think, if we stop and think about it, because we've been trained to think that way, if we don't actually physically see another black person in sight, we say, oh, well, there's no way to organize. I mean, oh, I'm helpless. Oh, I can't, oh, woe is me. I just dropped dead right now on this spot. You know, I got to be able to look in the distance and see a black person coming, and then now we we can organize. You can organize your own brain standing in the woods alone. What does that mean? It means you tap into the laws of the universe, which means cause and effect. You're doing it in a simple fashion already if you're just walking through the woods because it's you that's doing the walking. You're using the laws of the universe. All you have to do is put more and more of the laws of the universe into your brain. This is why knowledge and understanding is power. Yes. That's an organization, an organization of one. And then when you uh, organize in tune with the universe, in other words, just following the laws of the universe, water is wet. Fire will burn if you understand that, if you know how to use fire, how not to use it, what to avoid, 
when you're handling fire, because fire can get out of control, and how to handle water. A lot of people say water is weak. Well, if you've ever been in a flood, they'll find out that water, you know, not necessarily. The water is not weak when you are drowning in it. So, you know, but water is strong all the time. Everything has strength. When you're drinking it, it does things that nourishes the body. But when you take in too much, then you drown, and then you deteriorate. So it's a matter of balance and everything. These are the laws of the universe. Balance. Balance between water and fire. Balance between people with other people. These are your organizations. We don't understand what the word organization means. Mm. Because we were herded on ships and herded from one, uh, you know, uh, prison camp to another, we think that organization means a whole bunch of people standing shoulder to shoulder. That's why we think that some kind of magic will happen when we just march and don't have any kind of plan after the march. We think that all we have to do is just just get shoulder to shoulder with another black person, and somehow magic is going to happen because we're shoulder to shoulder. Say, okay, it's 10 million of us now standing in the desert, and if we just stand here and get shoulder to shoulder and march across the desert, somehow all kinds of miracles are just going to come our way. Why? Because we are a force together, we are organized, and we are marching shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> no, that's just a whole bunch of black people marching shoulder to shoulder. And that's why when we disperse and then go and sit down and think that miracles are going to happen as a result of we were marching shoulder to shoulder, it doesn't add up in the laws of the universe. You're listening to The Compensatory Concept, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com. And we're speaking with Nelly Fuller, Jr., the author of a United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a textbook for, a workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism, which is white supremacy. And you can get that book by um, getting on the web and going to producejustice.com. Uh, Mr. Fuller's crew has it all set up. It's very simple. Producejustice.com. You need to get the book. You need to read it and understand it. There's also an additional word guide uh, that comes along with the, with the book. I mean, that you can also purchase, and that will help you understand the, the, the codes that Mr. Fuller addresses. Uh, this comes from Donovan in um, Massachusetts. Uh, he said, uh, Mr. Bobby, can you uh, ask Mr. Fuller, does he have an opinion or theory as to why it is so common for our people to be so chummy with whites at work, but damn near contemptuous toward each other in the same setting, sometimes even before we get a chance to become familiar with each other as individuals? Thank you for your time. Donovan in Massachusetts. Mr. Fuller? Because hatred has been put into black people by the white supremacists. That's a straight-up answer. Black people can't stand black people in the system of white supremacy. And it's logical. Like I say, follow the logic. Follow the laws of the universe. We've been trained that way. And we have to be able to tell ourselves the truth that okay. we are that way. Now, what do you do about it? You minimize contact then you'll minimize that conflict. And any time you talk to another black person, have something constructive to say, or don't talk at all, because trivial talk, idle talk, among black people breeds contempt. Because, I mean, that's automatically going to happen. Okay. Anytime black people are just sitting around what you call just making small talk and trivial, it'll start off real innocent. I mean, you know, black people like to laugh and high-five and all that type of thing. And, you know, talk about this and talk about that and look for things to talk about. That's a dangerous situation. When you find any black people doing that, that you you got a potential powder cake and don't even know it. Because we have been trained that when we're around each other and we run out of things to say, we start picking at each other. That's an automatic, that's going to happen. That is going to happen. That is, go, you're going to talk about either someone who is present 
or you're going to talk about some black person that's not present, and somehow all of this talk, just sitting around what we call kicking it, particularly in the northwestern hemisphere, next thing you know, you've got yellow tape fluttering all over the neighborhood and white men with guns and radios and whatnot walking around cleaning up the mess. Yeah, that's not good. TalkTainmentRadio.com. Check us out on WCRS FM 98.3 Wednesday and Sunday evenings. Blogs and podcasts are available. Download TalkTainment Radio app to yourself or to your tablet. Listen, we go where you go on radio the way it should be heard. TalkTainmentRadio.com. And we'll be back with John Adams' questions and more on TalkTainmentRadio.com. TalkTainmentRadio.com is the premier Internet radio platform offering 40-plus talk radio-style programs professionally produced, optimized for online distribution, featuring Columbus, Ohio on-air personalities. TalkTainmentRadio.com offers listeners diverse programming options covering topics such as arts and culture, love, life, and relationships, technology, religion, paranormal activities, local and national politics, women's issues, alongside health and wellness. Listeners can access their favorite TalkTainmentRadio.com programs free of cost through the website. Download the TTR app to your cell phone and you can take us wherever you go. We have programs on demand to fit your schedule through our podcast. The address is TalkTainmentRadio.com. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18... One in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. I encourage you to learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Brought to you by Autism Speaks, the Ad Council, and TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The United Independent Compensatory Code System concept by Neely Fuller is considered as one of the substantial and basic books for understanding and effectively countering racism. Neely Fuller will turn upside down everything you've heard and everything you think you know about racism and how it works. Call area code 202-484-5461. 202-484-5461. I'm as bad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. You got the power. TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. That's radio the way it should be heard. This is The Compensatory Concept with Nelly Fuller, Jr. I'm your co-host, Mr. Bobby. Okay, Mr. Fuller, this comes from John Adams. He says, how do you identify another victim who is codified in behavior, especially in the workplace? What questions do you ask? Oh, you don't have to. That, that's what I mean by the United Independent Compensatory Code. You don't go around trying to identify other black people who are of like mind with you. What you do is just make sure that what you do is codified, meaning every move that you make should have a constructive result. That's all you have to remember in any situation that you're in. Look around for a way that you can make that situation as constructive as possible and interact with everybody, white and non-white, the same way, the same way. Be constructive at all times. Don't deviate from that. Otherwise, you get off into something that you're not going to be able to handle. Mm -hmm. And if you're going around trying to measure what everybody else's reactions are going to be, it's too overwhelming. So what you do is just make sure that what you do, always keep in mind, this thing that I'm fixing to say, is it going to produce a constructive result or a non-constructive result? It's going to be one or the other. There's no such thing as in between. See, that's what I mean by what we need as a code. We don't, you know, not just some abstract organization. 
mm. an organization, I mean, in, in, you know, in quotes, and without even having any definition of what that means, we got to organize. Another slogan black people use is black people got to come together. Come together? Come together and do what? We never get to the doing part. We just come together. See, that's that shoulder-to-shoulder thing again. Yes, sir. Thinking that that, that works some kind of magic, that things are just going to fall out of the sky, money and everything, all your problems are going to be solved. Why? Because we're standing here shoulder-to-shoulder. I mean, you know, you can stand shoulder-to-shoulder in the rain or in a, uh, a snowstorm and freeze to death. I mean, wh- what's that all about? Nothing. Yes. See, so have a code. The code means... Am I doing something constructive at this very moment, or am I doing something non-constructive? Because you better believe, even if you're sitting still or if you're in motion, you are either doing something constructive or non-constructive. Yes. There's no such thing as in between. That's all you got to remember mm-hmm. on a job or anything else. Constructive, non-constructive. non-constructive. And you can ask other people that question. Sir, sir, is this going to have a constructive result? And if so, how? Will you please tell me how? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in addition to the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept, a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism, which is white supremacy, and, of course, Mr. Nearly Fuller has written that book. Mr. Fuller also uh, researched and, and still research in another uh, publication by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. And I find that in addition to your works, which we can get your book at ProduceJustice.com, this book really breaks down the the Jim Crow system, which you um, addressed earlier in the program, uh, breaks it down in the newer form of it. And I would suggest that as you do your, as people, as you do your research, research that by uh, also by Michelle Alexander. Um, It's called The New Jim Crow. Uh, system and it is just out uh, woo it'll just blow your mind also uh, wheatmoney.com it'll put in perspective um, all the things that Mr. Fuller addresses in the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept a textbook workbook for thought speech and or action for victims of racism which is white supremacy it will bring it into a perspective that you can identify the things that you need to do and the codes that Mr. Fuller has uh, talked about. Um, let's see. Let's go to this one. Uh, first, of, Mr., this comes from Ken Purnell, Keith Purnell, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Fuller, first of all, I would like to thank you and Mr. Bobby uh, for your fantastic programming. It's not me. It's Mr. Fuller. It's not mine. I truly admire uh, Mr. Fuller's courage and wisdom in tackling one of the most appalling issues facing our entire planet over the past 40 years of life. Mr. Fuller's insight perspective on today's current events is refreshing and thought-provoking. My question is as follows. The non-white population is in the state of dire emergency, not only on a national level, but on a global stage. Why can't all of the brilliant non-white minds come together hmm, and form a collective or collaborative global effort to combat the system of racism, white supremacy? How can we shift the tide and change uh, this deadly course? Mr. Fuller? Make it a priority. Other than the priority we have now, our priorities are scattered all over the place. And codify what you do. Now, what I mean by priority, rid the world of the system of white supremacy, and in the process of doing so, replace it with a system of justice. Why? Logically speaking, because the system of white supremacy is about continuing the mistreatment of people. That's all it is, just another form of mistreatment. You know, people have been mistreating people, you know, every day somewhere on the planet since people have been on the planet, from what I've heard, uh, right from day one almost. But it's just, uh, white supremacy is just another form of mistreatment based on color. So you read that, the world of that, disease, and you replace it with something that is disease-proof, and that is justice and correctness. 
which means what? Balance between people and creatures and things. I mean, and then you'll have that thing that everybody's been talking about forever but not really making an effort to get, and that's peace. And what is justice? Guaranteeing that no person is mistreated, regardless of who that person is. Guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. And number two, guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. It doesn't get any better than that. And just set that as a goal. And just say that you codified, meaning on an everyday level, and, and address your code to an individual. That's what I've tried to do with the textbook for victims of white supremacy. Tailor everything to the individual. What does the individual person do? Because if you solve the problem of the individual person everywhere on the planet, you solve the problems of all people. So if you do this in an orchestrated manner, people don't, you know, that shoulder to shoulder thing, I'm going to keep talking about that. Because people think that you, like someone called in a while ago and said, how do you interact with another black person who is on the job and all like that? You interact with him or her the same way you interact with any person anywhere. Constructive, non-constructive. It's not rocket science. <laughs> Either everybody's doing something constructive or everybody's doing something non-constructive. Non -constructive, that's I right. mean, it's not but two categories. It's real simple. And you can always look at the result of what people do. You know, a drive-by shooting, what is that? Is that constructive? You know right off. You don't have to ask anybody. No, this is not constructive. Hmm. Carjacking someone at the airport, is this constructive? Is this going to produce a better world? No, it hasn't so far. Duh. This is Tony Mack calling from Houston, Texas again. I wanted to ask Mr. Fuller, how to determine if a person is under white supremacy, and if he can explain that. By the white supremacists mistreating someone who is non-white. This is how you know that a white person is a white supremacist. A white person is not a white supremacist just by being white. It's not the color, non-color, white. It's the mistreatment based on that that's been set up and institutionalized. So you know it when you're being mistreated in a system of white supremacy by a person who is classified as white. And you are being and all mistreated. You have to do, all you have to do is just recognize the mistreatment. You're right. And you don't have to look very far to see somebody being mistreated. No, sir. Somebody's being mistreated right before your eyes every day. I don't mm -hmm. care where you are. There's somebody being mistreated. Right, because Why? Because the system of white supremacy demands yes. that people mistreat people. Yes, it demands it. And it is, and it, and it is a system. You're right, Mr. Fuller. It's not a per it is a system that is designed and it's worldwide. Question from Lamont. He says, um, my real question is about race for president. From my understanding, the election, uh, is won off of electoral votes not popular votes. So why should a person with no electoral vote vote? Is that deception from the supremacists? Are they sitting back laughing and saying all the people going out to vote in bad weather and walking in lines and the popular vote doesn't even count? Yes, it counts for something, but very little, I mean, in the grand scope of things, because the white supremacists control all of the voting. They control everything that goes on in the system of white supremacy. But just like getting up and going to work, you do what you can. That's why I say vote. Sure, vote. I mean, you might get a little bit out of something. Uh, there's an old saying, a little bit of something is better than a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> okay. With that, we will go to uh, the phone line. Uh, go ahead, caller. You are on with Mr. Fulham. Go ahead. Uh, can I be heard? You can be heard. We're on a, a podcast, but you can be heard. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I appreciate you taking my call, Mr. Bobby and Mr. Fuller. Once again, thank you for the work that you've done. And uh, I truly appreciate the effort that you've put forward over the course of your lifetime. I wanted to say, uh, based on a comment made by a caller one or two calls ago, um, you, Mr. Fuller, said some years ago, that white people think in terms of 50-year increments, possibly even 100-year increments. They're always out in front of us in terms of what we're dealing with. Now, I heard the caller say to you that this is a done deal. There's nothing we can do to fix it. And I've always taken the position that what Mr. Fuller has done is given us a template to work from so that 
maybe 50 years down the road, those babies that are walking around and crawling now, they have a better understanding of the system they're up against and how to fight against it. So I believe that we do have a chance. Now, I know, Mr. Fuller, you would say it, wouldn't, it may not happen in your lifetime. I'm going to assume that it won't happen in my lifetime. But we owe something to our progeny. We owe something to those children in the future. We owe them a, a clearer and a better understanding of the system that they're up against. And you've done that. And if we stop looking at this as a done deal and a failed, a failed venture, I think that we can get them to a place they can ultimately challenge the people that maintain this system. It may not happen, and I may not see it, but I believe that we can do that. And I appreciate the work that you've done, and I appreciate the effort that you've put forth. I have the greatest respect for you. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking my call. All right. Thank you for calling. You care to respond to that, Mr. Fuller, before we go to the next uh, comment? Well, we can go to the next caller, but I'd just like to interject this right quick. This, uh, Many people think about a time frame, and they say the next generation, the next generation after that, the next generation after that. Uh, when I started writing, I, I, I tried as best I could to think of something to discard that type of thinking altogether. It may take a long time to put something together, because that's a law of physics. But something that it took a long time to put together doesn't necessarily mean it'll take a long time to take it apart. There are things that are put together over a period of years that can be taken apart in 15 minutes. Or less. I'm saying the system of white supremacy can be done just that fast. Okay. I mean, it's just a matter of knowing what buttons to push. Yes, sir. Okay, a uh, question from the Gmail from Elia O'Neill. She says, number one, why should we tell white women that they are, quote, the greatest and most fascinating people in the world? And she said that from page 133. And then why should a black person that is not directly subject to racism be concerned with eliminating it? So let's go to page 133. Whoops. Yeah, you care to uh, answer that, Mr. Fuller? Yes. Uh, white women are the most fascinating uh, females in the world. And uh, they are fascinating because they are attractive to people of color all over the world. Why? Because the white supremacist male and female have set up a system of white supremacy. So collectively, I mean, when you say fascinating, you mean attractive. What do you mean by attractive? Do you mean that they are necessarily what people would call pretty physically? No, but they attract the attention, both white males and white females. Both really have the attention of non-white people. And what do you mean by attention? And we are attracted to them because they have, through the system of white supremacy, taken everything that is of value, including all of the non-white people under their wing. So naturally they would be attractive all over the world. Non-white people are saying, which way did the white people go? Black people with their babies in their arms are strung out across the desert right now as we speak by the thousands saying, where are the white people? Where are, I'm attracted to wherever they are. I have to go wherever they are. I need a job. I need medicine for my baby. I need food. I mean, there's nothing here. With the, anywhere you find a whole bunch of black people, you find nothing. Unless there are some white people somewhere around or somewhere, I mean, in a helicopter going to drop something out of the sky to get me out of this flood. I got to get out of here. I got to move somewhere. Somewhere like where? Like where the white people went. These are the attractive people. They attract my attention. Why? Because that's where all the goodies are. Wherever you find them, you find that's where the goodies are. You go among a bunch, a whole bunch of dark-skinned people, there's nothing happening there except a whole bunch of misery. We know that from experience. It's called white supremacy, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. That's why they're attractive. 
You're listening to The Compensatory Concept, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, and our guest, as usual, is Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., the author of the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a textbook, workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism, which is white supremacy. You can get that and get your copy, and you need your copy. You can go to Produce Justice. Dot com and it's all set up for you, real simple. Before we go on to the next call, uh, Sharice uh, Dorsey, uh, we are having some technical problems, so if you go to the podcast, uh, and if you are listening, you are going to be listening to a podcast. The complete show will be on there. That's just the way that it is in this modern world. Uh, before we go on, Mr. Fuller, she, um, the last caller made a statement uh, or that it was in page on page 133, and then you asked some questions over there uh, to that question. You are one of the greatest and most fascinating uh, people in the world. Then you said, um, you, then you have some questions down there. You said, what is your ultimate objective? What do you think my ultimate ob- objective should be? And how do you intend for your ultimate objective to relate to mine? Those are very compelling questions that we should ask. Am I not correct? Yes, you can do this right to, right today. I mean, right in the next five minutes. I mean, right there on the job. You can tell the white lady that is sitting right next to you or coming down the hall, if you know her and on a speaking level with her. I mean, you know, find out what your objective is. You can say, you, ma'am, you are very attractive. You are very fascinating to me. I think you might know something that I need to know. You know, maybe, you know, is there any way that we can talk? And if you're already on a first-name basis with the person and they are not uncomfortable talking to you try to get information what is your ultimate objective uh, ma'am arlene whatever her name is i mean if you're on that first name basis i mean you talk all the time talk about something constructive for a change other than just fashions and what's on you know you saw on some gossip program on television i mean try to get some information that'll be useful white people know a lot they know a lot. They teach non-white people all over the world every day a little bit of what they know. So be willing to ask them. Don't be ashamed to ask for constructive information. You don't come into the world knowing anything. At least by the time you leave here, you should know something. And one of the fastest ways to learn things is from somebody who already knows. And the white supremacists, particularly the white people, I'm not saying all white people are white supremacists, but those who are white supremacists, and even some who are not what you call very smart, they are in touch with other white people who are smart, much more than you are. So get that information that will help you to do something of constructive value. Why? By asking for it. Just don't hold trivial conversation about little nonsensical things. Say, Arlene, uh, Miss Jones, Miss Greenberg, whatever your name is, will you please tell me something useful? You are a fascinating person. You are an attractive person. I am attracted to you on account of your knowledge and your understanding of how to get things done. I need a lot of things that need doing. And I don't know how to do it because I'm not getting enough information. I understand Miss Greenberg, Miss Hadley, Miss uh, uh, Georges, uh, Miss Johnson, whatever the name is, Mr. Jones, Mr. Scheinberger, whatever. Tell me something of constructive value. You are an attractive person. I'm attracted to you because of your knowledge. Yes, sir. So if you want to hear this show, you'll have to go to TalkTainmentRadio.com and then pull up the show, the compensatory concept, and your calls are so important. But the fact that you took the time to write in to me and let me know, we know that you are listening and, and are concerned. The books that you need to get today, number one, always, and make sure you do it, not just with your lips, but go ahead and get the The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism, which is white supremacy. You need to get that book to understand what you are uh, doing. And also somebody asked me, what were the other two books? You can go to wheatmoney.com to supplement your research. That will help you. And also uh, Michelle... Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. 
It will help you get a total perspective on exactly what Mr. Fuller has been talking about for years. It will help you identify racism, who, what it is, who it is, the system. It's not people, it's, it's a system. Don't get it twisted. And it will help you to understand it. Also, with Mr. Fuller's book, there's a word guide. And Mr. Fuller, can we speak? Can you speak to the word guide, uh, what it is and, and what, what it will do? It's called a, a compensatory counter-racist codified word guide. Now, that's a bunch of words that mean when you open it and you look at words, it's not a dictionary, but it tells you words to look out for as far as asking questions about what it means. Like the word respect. It's been kicked around forever. What's the definition of respect? How do you know it when you got it? How do you know it when you don't have it? You should be able to measure these things. Like the word America. Like like the word, the N-word. That has a definition that I gave it. Because the problem with that N-word is that for years, and right up to this very moment, have you ever asked anybody what it really means? Now, the, the, you can look in a dictionary, and that's the first thing that I did. And the one thing that I noticed in the dictionaries that I've looked at down through the years, looking at the N-word, what does it really mean? You say it's, it's a derogatory term for a person of Negro or African descent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the mystery term here, in that definition, you've got to always look for the definitions within definitions. Because sometimes they tell you absolutely nothing, like that definition doesn't. It says it's a derogatory term for a person of Negro or African descent, etc., etc., etc. That doesn't really tell you anything. Why? Because it says it's derogatory, but it doesn't tell you why it's derogatory. That's the key to its power. So it's really not a definition at all. When you give a word a concise definition, the word has limited power. A word that doesn't have a definition. You can make up any word right now and don't give it a definition. And that word will have unlimited power. So I gave what I consider the so-called N-word a correct definition for what it's really about. After years of thinking about it. And it means a victim of white supremacy. It's impossible to be the N-word unless you're subject to the system of white supremacy. So if you go by that definition, what does that make Neely Fuller? That makes him the N-word. But it's a word having that definition that will work for me. Because when I'm called that, the person who is calling me that is simply calling me a victim of white supremacy. That's all it is. Why? Because it has that definition. It has that definition. Why? I gave it that. The power of that N-word has been around all these years and causes people all this grief. The real power behind that word is it's never had a definition. You've had black people fumble with it, uh, an imaginary definition, say, well, anybody can be one. Or they'll say something like, uh, well, it means a mean, vile person. I mean, you know, but it's always been applied to black people, and white people will call black people by that term and then laugh. And when somebody's calling you by a word and you don't know the definition of it, they can always laugh at you because it doesn't have a definition. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Fuller, I, I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> as a victim of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the, what racism or the white supremacists have done, you've made this statement that, and I believe this, that not all white people are racist. Not all white people are racist, but those that are not racist, do do they benefit from the system of racism, white supremacy? Sure. I just wanted to be sure because I, I need to identify that, that when I look at people, I have to understand that not all white people are racist, but I do know that we live in a racist society, so I have to be aware of of the signs that follow. Well, okay, well, let's put it this way. Okay. Let, let's get it, make the rubber meet the road, because that's what codification is about. 
being concise, being focused. I'm sorry. We're going to have to leave it there. They yes. give me the sign to wrap it up. We'll try to get into that next week. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the call, uh, callers, caller. And again, thank you, Mr. Fuller. Talktainmentradio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio the way it should be heard. We'll see you next week on the greatest station in the nation, Talktainmentradio.com. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why one should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTainment Radio.